We've got a journey to go on today. It started off with such a simple idea, playing The Sims 2, but it swiftly descended into a month of misery. EA doesn't sell the game anymore, and there's a lot of reported issues of it working on modern versions of Windows, so we already know this is going to be a challenge. I've acquired a rip of the original CD, alas the installer requires a key from the box that I don't have. So I've opened it up in a debugger and started setting some breakpoints on things that I think will get hit, like the message box A function, which is the Win32 function for creating a message box. However, it's not hit, and also pausing the process in the debugger still allows me to interact with the GUI, which is also strange. Looking at the files, we've got setup exe and auto run exe, as well as auto run GUI.dll. Running both the exes seems to give me the same GUI, so I'm going to run setup exe under prop1 to get an idea of what's going on. It's looking for a lot of files specific to other games, so maybe this is a shared installer. I can see it's looking for auto run exe and the auto run GUI.dll. Running autorun.exe with propmon, it seems to copy itself into a temp folder and then relaunch itself with the dash restart dir flag. Ah, uh, okay, I see what's going on. This isn't a new window, it's a new process called the sims2code.exe. And if we disassemble this, we can see that this function checks the key and displays this error if it's wrong. So the call to sprint f here turns all the separate key parts into one string and passes that to this function, which currently returns zero. If we change the return value in this register to 1, then we don't get the error message and the program exits. So we're really faced with three choices. One, we could try and find a key online somewhere. Two, we could replace this program with another that just returns success so it thinks there's a legitimate key. Or we could patch the installer so that it just ignores the CD check entirely. So obviously we're going to go for option 4, to reverse engineer out the keygen algorithm so we can generate our own keys. Because that just sounds like more fun. Looking at the actual check function, it gets past the key and some other values and then calls two functions. The first shuffles the input around and stores it back on the stack, and then the second mixes in some other characters. So we can see that our initial string here gets shuffled to this and then mixed to this. But where did those other characters come from? The comparison at the end is a partially unrolled loop that checks if the input key is the same as the final transformed key. Each iteration checks the next two characters, and if they're not equal, it breaks. However, if we reach the end of the string, it then returns true. So the game now is, how can we craft an input that remains the same after it's gone through these two transformation steps? Let's look at the first function, which is the one that just shuffles things around. It starts off with what might be the most horrific mem copy I've ever seen. It calculates the difference between the dest and the source address by subtracting them, and then uses that as an array index into the source. So effectively, it's passing a negative number as an array index to source, which actually happens to be the address of dest. This took me a few passes through the code to figure out why copying from the key looked like it was just writing back to the key. Anyway, copying the string it uses some global offsets to swap various characters around, and if we rename these to something meaningful it becomes a lot more obvious what's going on. And we can easily write some C++ that reproduces this. Now for the second function, the one that mixes in additional characters. It does a lot more than shuffle. At a glance it takes a copy of the local buffer, does a load of crap to it, and then copies it out via the previous shuffle method. As the shuffle method is just swapping characters around, this should, in theory, undo the first shuffle. First thing it does is call this function, which iterates through the first 13 characters and calculates some sort of hash or checksum. It then calls another function. This takes a local buffer and our hash value zored with some other input. It looks like it splits this number into 5-bit chunks and uses those as indices into some global array of characters. These are then written into the supplied array. So maybe this is where those extra characters are coming from. The magic input that Zord with the checksum always seems to be ox1c38e. Experimentally, we can see that the transform process only affects 7 characters, the rest are left unchanged. So there's a 7 byte checksum that's embedded into the key, and this makes sense, as you can generate loads of random looking keys with just one checksum. I've recreated this all in C++, but it's still not accepting the key, so there must be another transformation that's going on and I think it's this function here. It uses some data that seems to be generated at runtime, as it's not directly stored in the binary, but if we just copy that out from the debugger... Okay, so I've taken the decompiled source of the various transformation functions and tidied them up and copied in the extra runtime data, and we can now generate keys. running the game and we now get a message saying that we need to insert the CD, so I guess just having the ISO mounted isn't enough. 
Looking around, it seems like The Sims 2 used safe disk, a now deprecated form of DRM. It works in two ways. The first involves adding bad sectors and messing around with the CD so that a lot of software will fail to copy it. And the second is a driver level check, which Microsoft removed due to security issues. So this could be tricky. So I've attached the debugger and now I get a new message warning me that I've got a debugger attached. In order to prevent people doing exactly what I'm trying to do, games will often try and detect the presence of a debugger at runtime, and if they do detect one, we'll exit out. So we'll need to fix that. Just to see what would happen, I put a breakpoint on the Windows function is debugger present. This is probably the most basic way of checking if a debugger is attached, and sure enough, it is hit. I've patched the return result in the debugger to return zero, but I still get the error message, so there must be other checks at play here. Going up the stack a bit, there's a whole bunch of function calls here, of which the isDebuggerPresent check is the first. We can skip over the next few functions because they just return success even with a debugger attached, they must be doing something else. The next one that fails is here. This calls NT query information process, but it looks like it deobfuscates these strings at runtime, so it's actually easy just to see how this works in the in the debugger. It calls the function with process information class 7, which means process debug port, and from the docs this retrieves a dword pointer value that is the port number of the debugger for the process. A non-zero value indicates that the process is being run under the control of a ring3 debugger. Oh, so I patched out that return value and we can pass that check. Now the next failing one is here. This grabs the PEB or the process execution block, and this is a structure that Windows creates for each running process. Part of that structure is a field called being debugged, which the code here is checking for. And after that, we get another failing function, and this is a bit less obvious. After checking some version information, it ends up calling get module handle A to get a handle to the loaded kernel32 DLL. It then calls this function, which looks complicated. It then does a bunch of arithmetic on kernel32 DLL module and enters a loop. This loop goes byte by byte through some offset in the module, and if any of them are minus ox34, it sets a flag. If the flag is set, then we fail the check. I've stared at this for a little bit, and finally, the light bulb has come on. Minus ox34 is pretty meaningless, but its unsigned value is oxcc. So this is a one byte instruction that debuggers silently insert into code when you set a breakpoint. When it's executed, Windows will suspend the process and notify the attached debugger that a breakpoint has been hit. So this is going through the loaded code for kernel32 to see if we've set any breakpoints in it. And in fact, if we stop when the flag is set and look at what address it was checking, then sure enough, we can see it's on a breakpoint that we set earlier. Cute. I like it. Anyway, if we patch the return value, then this was the last check and we eventually end up back at the original missing CD error message. Problem we've got now is that all these patches to remove the anti-debugging checks, I'm just doing manually in the debugger, and we don't want to have to do those every single time we run the game. In theory, we should just be able to patch the binary so that the function that does all the checks always returns zero. However, there's a problem. The code isn't actually running from within the binary, it's running from this mysterious tilde df394b.temp file. I'm poking around, this is loaded from a temp directory and when the game exits, it's deleted. So every time I run the game, this DLL is created, loaded, and then deleted. But it must be loaded from somewhere. My guess is that it's somehow packed into the original executable file and then unpacked at runtime. Let's put a breakpoint on create file A and we can see here when it tries to create the file. However, the call stack is weird. None of these addresses exist, so there's clearly some shenanigans at play. If we step over the code till we return, then we end up at the call site and I can see those weird addresses on the call stack. Basically, in a normal program, you push the return address onto the stack and this is how the function knows where to return to when it's finished executing. Tooling, like my debugger, can walk these addresses to build up a call stack. What I suspect is going on is some hand-rolled assembly to push garbage values to the stack which messes up my tooling. We're going to have to do this the old-fashioned way, stare really hard at the assembly to try and divine some meaning. I can see there's several calls to ebp plus some number, and looking at ebp, we can see there's a bunch of kernel32 functions. So these are computed and then called, which again makes it harder to see in the tooling as the functions aren't called directly. Also, all of these addresses look like my messed up stack, which is clever, putting actual function addresses on the stack. So tracing through all this, we eventually end up at this function, which is passed a file handle to the running exe file. It then calls global alloc to allocate some memory, calls set file pointer to adjust the read position to some fixed offset, and then calls read file to read from the game exe into the allocated buffer. Now this offset into the game exe looks like garbage, so I suspect that it's actually obfuscated. 
In fact, if we continue through the assembly for a bit, we end up at this bit shifting and zoring mess. Just stepping through it, we can see that it slowly reveals a PE header, so this is our deobfuscation algorithm. I sure hope this is the only deobfuscation algorithm I have to figure out. Anyway, I've recreated it in C++, as well as the inverse. So now I can patch the DLL in Ghidra, obfuscate it, stuff it back into the executable, and back to the CD check. So we've defeated the anti-debugging techniques. So setting a breakpoint on the Windows function that creates the message box, we can see we're executing inside another temporarily created DLL, this time called tilde deeca4.temp. And if we keep going through the code, we end up back at the previous df394b DLL. But there's two interesting things here. One, we're executing in the data section, which in the DLL file is all zeros. And two, we're executing unaligned instructions. So they really don't want me messing around with this. Even if I patch out this check, we eventually end up at exit process. So there's probably multiple checks for the CD, just like there was multiple checks for a debugger. Looking at the entry function or the first function that the game runs, we can see that it either ends up calling exit process or taking this jump. However, the code at the end of this is rubbish or like the first instruction says, ass. I think we need to see how this really works with a real CD. So I've brought one for the princely sum of two pounds sterling. Of course, this has immediately revealed a new problem. And so, for more than the price of the game, I brought myself a Froibetz. And now we can continue. The game doesn't actually work on Windows 11, probably because Microsoft disabled that vulnerable driver, but it does work in a Windows 7 VM, so I'll be switching back and forth between this and my host machine for the rest of the video. So running through a bit on a working version, I can see that the code the entry eventually jumps to does become real code, so it must be being runtime deobfuscated. My current thinking is that if we can figure out the deobfuscation, then we can just unpack the code and jump directly to it and skip out all the CD checks entirely. If we set a hardware breakpoint on the first four bytes of the obfuscated code, then the debugger will stop when the program writes to it. From here, we can see the obfuscation algorithm being used. It runs each four bytes through this mess, which just does a bunch of bit manipulation, including all these rotate lefts or rolls. The thought of recreating all this in C++ gave me a stomachache, so instead I just copied all this from the debugger and munged it into some inline assembly. So this works. I can see in Ghidra this function is actually a call to win main CRT startup, so the game does all this checking before it even hits the start of the main program. But this still crashes, and I can see that not all of this section was deobfuscated, in fact the start of the section is still rubbish. So again, hardware breakpoint deep dive. After the first double pass or thing, it goes through another obfuscation algorithm, this time byte by byte. Basically, you end up calling this function on each byte, and it takes a pointer to some static data, which is always the same as far as I can tell, and then some dynamic data that changes on each call. Just looking at the memory dump, I can see that the dynamic data is just a small circular buffer. It shifts all the elements along by one, and then inserts the latest deobfuscated bytes. So that's not too bad. Let's look at the actual deobfuscation algorithm that uses all this data. Uh... So I've just copied all this decompiled code from Gija into C++ and I fixed it up so it at least compiles. Now I've painstakingly stepped through the real assembly and my approximated code instruction by instruction and fixed up all of Gija's mistakes. Right, so I can now fully deobfuscate this section. Interestingly, this misery here works in OX 1000 byte chunks, but only applies to the first four and a bit chunks. Thanks. However, this does explain how I could deobfuscate WinMain CRT startup, as that is way after the first OX 4000 and something bytes. Of course, it still crashes. You didn't think we were done yet, did you? WinMain CRT startup is failing somewhere in Dunder C in it, which sounds important. There's a bunch of global state that's different between my version and the legit version. I'm wondering if I can just launch the game normally and attach a debugger to it and just start dumping state. So I can't attach a debugger to the game after it's launched because it says a debugger is already attached, which is strange. I can see in process monitor that another random process is running, again, from the temp directory. This has strings like clean up in it, so I'm wondering if this is launched by the original game at some point. Anyway, the new program checks some command line arguments and digging around a bit, it tries to match them against this regex. If we just dump the command line args that the program was called with, we can see that it was past the PID of the running game. 
I wonder if this process attaches itself as a debugger to the game when it first starts. This would make sense as it would then prevent me from attaching a debugger to the game, which is quite clever. I also wonder if it maybe provides some additional state to the game which then allows it to continue. I don't want to reverse engineer another program, so let's take a step back. I can see it's reading a file from the CD, so maybe we can just copy the data from that file into the binary and patch out the check to read from that new static buffer. Unfortunately, this file is read from the DE lib, which is packed into the DF34 lib, and of course, it uses a completely different obfuscation algorithm. Did everyone in the office that day just have a go at writing an obfuscation algorithm? What is this? Bring your obfuscation algorithm to work day? To cut a long story short, this algorithm was particularly egregious. The data was split over several locations in memory, it bit shifted the data by varying amounts per byte, and finally, there were several code paths that led to this algorithm based on if the previous result was even or odd, or based on some global data, and each one passed in different constants. So no, I didn't fully reverse engineer it, however, I did manage to recover the first 9 bytes. I've got one more idea, if I can just inject myself into the game then maybe I can rewire it internally to make it think that a CD is present. I really want this to be a one click and done kind of thing, I don't want to have to launch another program and inject myself in, so I need to find some way of getting the game to launch my code. Luckily it's quite easy to track down where the code loads the second pack library which does the CD check. So I've patched the load library call to actually jump to a code cave where I've written some assembly to load a custom library, which in turn loads the original library. However, that crashes, and all I can think of is that it's doing some sort of hash or checksum over the game binary to check if it's been modified. But that doesn't make sense because we could patch out the anti-debugging techniques. I wonder if, like we've seen previously, that hash or checksum only applies to the first few chunks of bytes, which would make sense as the load library call is near the start of the library. Anyway, I found another patch point further down which does work. I've now set about overwriting several entries in the IAT or import address table. This essentially means that the game thinks it's calling a Windows 32 function, but instead it actually calls my code instead. So through all this I can proxy all the calls the game makes, including opening and reading files as well as making direct IO calls. So using this I can actually make the game think that there's a CD drive mounted at A, when really all it does is forward all those calls to the real drive mounted at D. Alas, this doesn't work with the Froibets unplugged. I must be missing some syscall somewhere, or there's some custom device I.O. that I've just missed. I got to the point where I was reversing individual SCSI commands that the game was sending to the drive just to try and divine some meaning. Given unlimited time, I'm confident that I could reverse this, and in fact there are still a few threads that I can pull on, however I am exhausted, and I really just want to draw a line under this and tell the story that I've got so far. However, if you're still craving low-level reverse engineering, then you're going to want to check out what I did to Diablo 2.